Hey everybody, I wanted to go over a major breakthrough that we've had here on our farm. Um, there's probably other people out there in the world who are doing this, but I can't find them. I would never claim to be the first to do this. But what you are looking at is switchgrass. And in the background is a whole bunch of orchard grass and medium red clover and a little bit of chicory your typical cool season pasture. We have successfully managed to establish uh, a thin or a, a sparse bit of uh, switchgrass in our cool season pastures. The reason that's significant, um, it gives us better grazing during the summer. This grass here in the foreground loves when the temperatures are above 90 degrees. This is a less than two year old plant, so it is not mature yet. It needs to be at least three to five years old before it's full, fully mature. And at that age, it should be in decent soil. Um, it should be seven to nine feet tall. And likewise, below the soil, which is why it's so important. I chose switchgrass. Uh, we put about, we'll say, a 10% mixture uh, when we seeded the rest of this field at the same time with the sheep. No tillage, no, not even disking this section. Uh, we seeded it all in the spring, but uh, with the grasses and clovers and everything else. Initially, the, the clover and chicory came in very strong. Um, this was all a soybean field. I don't think it had enough tilth or uh, soil biology to support the grasses. But over time, the orchard grass has really kicked in just this year. So let's say two, two full growing seasons later. Um, but anyway, we chose switchgrass because of its ability to survive in wetter conditions. If we were more arid, um, I probably would have chosen a different type or a blend of all of them. But switchgrass can, once established, that's the trick, um, survive wet conditions, survive drought, survive heat. Uh, and it can survive a little bit closer grazing. Now, it might be very hard for you at this angle to see the switchgrass, so I'll go down low, and you can see a haze uh, all through this sward. And I'll walk it just so you can see but right now that seed head well let's say the blade because that's what i count the blade here is only three and a half four feet tall uh it's it kind of throws you off because our orchard grass is so lush uh, a lot of these orchard grass blades are three feet long but you walk out here and there are switchgrass shoots coming up everywhere uh, and which is great. I don't want one solid thing of it here and not so much there, although I say that, that's what we've got here. So this kind of environment down in here is exactly where quail would like to live. Now I went to a seminar, uh, Ohio Forge and Grassland Council, wonderful information. Um, I guess it was the annual meeting. But the specific topics were partnering with the DNR uh, to re-establish quail habitat. Um, the main message I took away from that is that it is near impossible to do cool season plants and warm season grasses, especially together. Um, I guess I am writing that book now as we speak. Um, I have bunch grasses via the orchard grass and fescue to an extent, but the quail like to go in through here uh, where they're protected by the over cover and they can go in between the gaps in the plants. Now I, I doubt, knowing what I learned there, that the orchard grass alone would be sufficient. But there will be patches of that switchgrass, especially as it gets taller, that will be wonderful for quail. Now, one of the main reasons it's so hard um, to have them 
in the same piece of uh, warm season grasses and cool season on the same piece of ground is establishment. Uh, warm season grasses take two years to establish. You cannot graze them too close. Uh, so anyone doing continuous grazing can forget about it. And anyone doing rotational grazing and they take it too low, you can forget about it. Um, there's all these different uh, challenges. And even once it is established, warm season grasses really should not be grazed below six inches. Um, Switchgrass is said to be a little bit more tolerant and you could take it down to four. We'll test that. And I think a lot of it has to do with soil fertility and moisture. But I'm walking through what the cattle have been on where we first started seeing the switchgrass. And I wanted to show you some plants and what they left. So here is a the bottom part of the switchgrass. Yes, we took more than 50%, but they left us a good 10 inches. That plant will be fine. It'll be great, wonderful, grand, groovy. Um, what they seem to do is take bites off of the top piece of the switchgrass and then leave the rest. Man, it is really hard to tell that, okay? Here's another one. Uh, and some more. See, that's what they do. This one here is orchard grass. They just come in and wrap their tongue around and bite off of half of it. Uh, and that's really, really, really good. Oh, don't make me out to be a liar. Where are you? Um, so what we're doing this time of year, <clears throat> we're leaving more orchard grass and other cool season grasses than we would like in an effort to encourage our warm season grasses, uh, really grass, we only established switchgrass. It is from seed that we purchased. <clears throat> so you can see here, this is a nice comparison. Right here, we have orchard grass. You can see the telltale central rib here. They ate the top of it, um, maybe a little less than half of that plant, but it was all leaf uh, material. Over here, we have switchgrass. They ate 60 to 70%. This is the one that was my shoulder height. I am five foot 10, five foot nine. They ate stem and all. Why is that? Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with warm season grasses versus cool season, the WSGs, as you'll see, have this ability um, to photosynthesize using the C4 pathway instead of C3. So you'll see them referred to as C4 grasses. Uh, another case in point, I believe this one was Johnson grass. Could be wrong on that, but it looks too green to be blue-green like uh, switchgrass. Anyway. Above 85 degrees, cool season grasses struggle. Now there are ways to help with that. Obviously, we planned out our orchard um, to give it a moving shade. Um, we'll have other plants in there to help shade it like clovers and alfalfa that appreciate the heat a little bit more. Um, but it generally cannot photosynthesize uh, above 85 degrees. The warm season grasses love it when it gets above 90 degrees. They'll grow, I believe, above 80 and below 70. I think they're dormant. Uh, someone check me on that. Uh, not professing to know everything here. but So it's really, really important to have both. Let's say this plant here gets to be 7, 8 feet tall, like I was saying before. And there are a couple different plants in this immediate area. Guess what your orchard grass is doing? It's growing because at its height, it's a lot cooler. Now, you guys probably did notice the weeds that the cattle left. We've only got the four steers in there right now. All of our sheep, to include the rams, are off on another property grazing. The sheep would have eaten this and the ragweed. Uh, guarantee it. 
There's very little that our sheep won't eat. But anyway. So right now we're moving the cattle twice a day on a paddock that is this big. I'm gonna go in here and see how we're doing. So again, you can see the grazing habits of the cattle. You can see the orchard grass just kind of topped off. That is really, really, really good if you can keep them from going back and getting another bite. That's one of the ways we've built up um, our pastures so fast uh, is by making sure they don't graze too low. And I'm not saying we're perfect. There are times where they do graze too low. At which point, being so flexible in our grazing, we skip those paddocks. We can look at a pasture and say, okay, if we have three foot uh, orchard grass right here, so tall that the blades are laying down, and the next paddock up, it's only 10 inches, and it looks like it's struggling, well, we probably did something wrong last go around. We're gonna skip it. And it's not hard uh, to do uh, without any infrastructure out here. We don't even have perimeter fence yet. Uh, we're working on it. But we just use this net fence, create a real narrow length, and skip it. Those skills are what are going to, are what is going to help um, other producers get the option or the ability or the situation like we have to have warm season grasses in a cool season pasture. So now that we've proven we can do it, we're going to start having other species brought in to these same pieces of pasture. Now, another bit of advice, they can the switchgrass cannot be grazed let's say in our area, Southwest Ohio, from the end of June, buddy, you got a little bit of poopy butt. Uh, from uh, the end of May, I would like to say through June. It worked out wonderfully this year because we had a record hot May. Uh, and so with the sheep, that sent us scampering to the woods and we rotated the sheep all along the wood line and even though this, these pieces in between the trees uh, are orchard trees, this mix is the same as that mix. Because of the way we've grazed this differently, the switchgrass came in over here and we do not see any along the trees because we've grazed it too hard. As I was saying earlier, case in point. Um, now, uh, there are certain ways that I think we should use warm season grasses to their full benefit and understand what they do and do not do. I would argue it is hard to finish cattle on warm season grasses. What I mean by that, they should maybe be gaining two pounds a day on your warm season pastures. Um, the orchard grass, like I said, above 85, it struggles to photosynthesize. Um, and I am sure it's the same for perennial ryegrass. Fescue has a couple adaptations that help it, um, called the endophyte. If you have novel endophyte fescue, it might be great, but it's still going to be challenging to finish animals whose hides are black in the heat. They're heat stressed. We have that trailer there. Um, we did not move it, uh, into here this morning. I'm, or well, actually it was about an hour ago. Uh, I'm wondering if my wife thought with all this cloud cover they don't need it, which is a smart choice because that little thing creates bare spots because they run around and run around and run around and they fight to get under there or they rubbing, using it to rub. Anyway, so like I was saying, oh buddy, you got a lot. Hardly any face flies, but all in the body. Okay. We got essential oils for that. But what I was saying, we'll bring in more uh, species of warm season grasses. We've already got Johnson grass. Everybody's got that around here. Uh, Johnson grass, you have to be careful because of the prussic acid at the first hard frost. 
which is another benefit to not doing your whole pasture in something like this mix here. So we'll bring in the warm season grasses. I'll probably especially feature them up on that hill where it remains pretty dry and droughty, which is where they would come in, um, but not go near the woods. We graze that too hard right now. Once these fruit trees come in, I might establish a little bit more throughout and see what happens. But I'm just giving you guys this advice because warm season grass seed is very, very expensive. Why is it expensive? I'm glad you asked. Generally, warm season grasses can go a long time without getting grazed in the natural environment. Because they have such a deep root system, they can pool on more energy stores. They can pull more minerals from lower in the soil. Therefore, their need to reproduce is negligible compared to cool season grasses that have to reproduce before it gets too hot and then they're spent. So once established, warm season grass stands generally last longer when maintained properly. And that leads to a harder time producing seed. Uh, and as the soil gets healthier and healthier and healthier, um, and this goes for cool season as well as warm season grasses, their need to go to seed diminishes because they have everything they need and they know um, grasses and bison, or cattle essentially, some thing that eats animals, co-evolved. The grass needs to be eaten in order to grow and stay healthy. If you let the grass go it will go to seed maybe a few few years in a row but it will eventually start to peter out and then you'll get other plants that the grass without its nutrition the grass cannot compete against so it becomes more and more woody species bushes at first um, and then eventually straight up trees and that is succession in a nutshell so by keeping everything vegetative uh, I think that's an offspring song. Gotta keep it vegetative. Uh, you can essentially keep that, that carbon pump that is your sward going. And the more that carbon pump pumps, the more soil life you've got. The more soil life you've got, the more of a carbon pump you'll get. The more of a carbon pump you'll get, the more above ground life you'll get. The more above ground life you get, it's this awesome spiral that can and is reversible so please be careful but i hope you guys are inspired to rewrite the book uh, if anybody has any questions reach out to us especially on facebook semper grazing ranch um, we are getting our website up we are working day and night to get our perimeter fencing up and our interior fencing and once we do that we'll be featuring conferences and schools and training sessions um, because this is our passion to teach people how to do this stuff the stuff that people say cannot be done if you guys have any questions let us know <laughs>